Good morning. morning. Would you join me in the call to worship? There is something about going to the mountain. Forty days where he was vulnerable before God. Carve out time and space, and God will make it holy. Let us go to the mountain. Join me, please, in the opening hymn, 40 Days and 40 Nights. you join me in the opening prayer. For every mountaintop encounter we have with you, O loving God, we are made different. We come to reflect your merciful kindness just a bit more, whether it is a mountain or a hilltop, alongside a lake or sitting in the backyard. Provide us a spirit that seeks such moments encourage us to be intentional in this work. And even though Moses was able to find 40 days, we come this morning seeking 40 minutes, or at least a few moments where we can find ourselves with you. This we pray in the name of your revelation of grace, Jesus Christ, amen. time in our worship where we turn to each other and give each other a holy hug.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, good morning. It is always a joy to be in this space, to be in here with you, to recognize that we are not alone, that God's presence has chosen to meet us. I want to remind you that in your worship guides this morning, you find those blue cards. If you would, please take this time to fill them out. Let us know you were here. If there's been a change in your address, phone number, please note that, because we'd like to update our records. But also make, uh, uh, take this opportunity to uh, let us know how we can pray for you. And on the back side, there is a place to list your prayer concerns or your joys. I want to share some good news. The youth building is getting so close to being finished. The flooring is in. Uh, the painting is basically complete. We are waiting for the arrival of the bathroom stalls. But uh, hopefully they will be here tomorrow. Um, but uh, we'll see when they arrive, and those still need to be installed and some touch-up paint, but we're really getting close, and I hope that in just a few short weeks we'll be able to open up that building. And what's so nice is we fixed the first floor, while well, suddenly we have three floors available to us. Next Sunday is Mother's Day, and for both Mother's Day and then next month, Father's Day, we're going to do something a little different this year. We're going to invite you, if you would like, to make a gift in honor or in memory of your mother. And all of those funds will go toward our restoration work here at the church. And we will be listing uh, everyone, all the mothers whose uh, uh, gift was given. And it's not going to be the largest gift going to be at the top. And No, no, we're just going to, it's, at this point, it's all about honoring mothers and remembering mothers and being able to uh, do something special with that money. And then finally, I want to lift up yesterday was our area assembly and uh, the closing worship service. Some wonderful things happened, including the installation of the new youth ministry team and that includes four youth from the greater Houston area, and our own Anna Jacobson was installed. Uh, uh, you see her in the bright blue uh, shirt there. But it was a wonderful, wonderful event, and it was neat to see Anna up there getting installed. And this is the group that helps to lead um, and prepare a church camp. Uh, they help prepare and work on the fall and spring retreats and many other things. So. We celebrate with Anna this day as she is installed. Well, today is our last Sunday with Jerusalem at our back. Actually, I hope it's not. I hope not, every, um, not only every Sunday, but every day we are stretching ourselves and putting Jerusalem at our back, putting that place of comfort in our lives behind us and moving out to where God wants us to be. But this is the last Sunday in our worship series. And I'm going to invite you to hear again these words that we have shared every week from the first chapter of the book of Acts. After his suffering, Jesus showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days speaking to them about God's kingdom. While they were eating together, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. He said, this is what you heard from me. John baptized with water. But in only a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus replied, It isn't for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. May these words, these familiar words that we have heard for now five weeks, may they resonate within us. Let us go to God in prayer. O gracious and compassionate God, we pause and open ourselves to you. A lot stands in the way, a lot of stuff and muck and baggage that needs to be left behind in this moment so that we might better follow the way of Jesus. We come seeking your assistance in this important work. Amen. When I am on Facebook, I tend to skim over a lot of stuff. Especially those posts that say, if you love Jesus, you will share this post. Let's be honest, those posts tend to come from folks that want to believe that loving Jesus requires just one click on the keyboard. As if the Jesus we follow said, take up your keyboard, click share, and you will be my disciples. I think it's a little more complicated than that. But I do like when you post about your children, your grandchildren, the funny things that they have said and done. Especially when it comes to faith or religion or God, I often make note of those. I like the parents who told their child, God is watching you every day. And she thought about it for a moment, and then said, who came up with that idea first, God or Santa? <laughs> Good question. Or the parents who told the young boy, Jesus is watching all the time. And he said, even when I'm in the bathroom? <laughs> or the child that was learning about Jesus and the story of him walking on water and and he said, did Jesus have to practice? When he was young, was there, and I love this, was there a, a peewee league on water walking? <laughs> the thoughts and the questions that children put forth demonstrate that their brains are constantly thinking. And they are curious about everything. I have a feeling that if I were to ask what questions do you have of God or for God, you would have a long list of such questions. Well, I put that question before our elders. That group of people in the life of our community that we call forth every year to provide spiritual leadership to our congregation. Based upon the words from Acts 1, after, the, after Jesus was resurrected, and it says that he spent 40 days with his disciples, I pose the question to our elders, if you had 40 days with Jesus... What questions would you ask? Let me begin by saying how thrilled I was that not a single elder says, why did God create mosquitoes? Because I think if you were to ask Jesus that question, you would get an eye roll. And a really? That's all you got? I even sense some sarcasm coming from Jesus saying, Yes, the mosquitoes, they were created to irritate people who ask irritating questions. But no one asked that big theological question, why do bad things happen to good people? 
It's a good question, an important question, a challenging question. But like the disciples who were getting ready to find themselves with the task of taking God's message beyond Jerusalem, to all of Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth, I imagine that they had some very practical questions, some down-to-earth questions about what this might mean, especially in light of this Jesus disappearing very soon. Well, in my crowdsourcing of the elders, asking them, what would you ask of Jesus if you had 40 days with him? The questions, as I suggested, were less about why do bad things happen to good people, but in light of difficulties, pain, inequality, injustice, addiction, suffering, hate, am I doing enough? Am I doing what I should be doing? Is there more that I could be doing? Am I really making a difference? When you think about the disciples, just a few weeks earlier, they paraded into Jerusalem with palm branches waving as if they owned the town. And just a few days later, their leader was executed. He, now he's back. Not to lead an assault on the headquarters of the Roman occupying force, but to prepare these disciples that they might go forth, that they might leave Jerusalem, that they might go somewhere else, to go beyond every line drawn in the sand, every line of demarcation, every line embedded in their minds by fear and insecurity, every single line that suggests that some are not worthy, some are not acceptable, some are not lovable, some are not good enough, some are not redeemable. Jesus was calling them to go, to march their little feet over those lines and with their presence and with their voices announce the good news of God's kingdom, the reign of God the holy kingdom, as we talked about a few weeks back. Here's the thing. We might do it. We might take the risk. We might step beyond our comfort zone. We might expand our zone of courage. But because we do so, we might find ourselves rejected, humiliated, undermined, disillusioned. And like many of the elders that I talked to, some friends that I asked that very same question to, and I believe the disciples, the hope, the passion, the vision can feel a bit shaken. And the zone of courage begins to retract and diminish. Even Mother Teresa came to know what some call the dark night of the soul, an absence of God, or at least a feeling as if God is not there. Much of this was revealed when there was the publication of some of her letters a few years after her death. Many were shocked by what they read, leading some to conclude that she no longer had believed in God. But there is a difference between not believing in God and not feeling God's presence. Yet she continued, even in that dark night of the soul, she continued in her work of the line-crossing, kingdom-building stuff, even though deep down she was still asking, is it enough? Is it right? Is it worth it. When I think about 40 days, that number 40, I, I think it's less about the number that falls between 39 and 41. I think it symbolizes something. In sports, there is the magic number. 
the number of victories required for the team to win their division, to win the pennant, to, to win out. Well, 40 is not a magic number. It is a miracle number. It represents a period of time where an individual or a group is made ready for something miraculous. And it's not necessarily 40 days. It might be 22 days. It might be 40 minutes. It might be seven and a half minutes. But it represents time with God. A time when we are reminded why we are doing what we are doing. For lack of a better description, it represents a divine pep talk. One that most of us need if we are going to be doing what some describe as unpopular, what's risk-taking, demanding. Because there's going to be pushback. There are going to be momentary defeats. There's going to be short-term losses. There's going to be unexpected negativity. There's going to be potential danger to self, to reputation, to our checkbooks. Richard Rohr, the Franciscan priest and well-known author, talks about the team of folks that he works with and how every morning they spend 20 minutes in silence. Rohr describes this time as a time to find a yes for the day. To say yes to the God-given opportunities before me, he says. But to claim that yes, Rohr says, I must detach myself from every no from the previous day. The mistakes, the feelings of failure, of being overwhelmed, the negative thoughts that others have attempted to impose upon me, and the list goes on and on. I can only do what I believe God wants me to do if I take the time every day to find that yes, that divine affirmation. I think that's Roar's 40 days. He just does it in 20-minute segments every single day. I believe we all need a yes as we find ourselves with a headache from beating our heads against the proverbial wall. We all need a yes as we feel as if with every step there is somebody who's trying to take us out at the knee. We need a yes as it appears like our attempts of living the Jesus life yesterday accomplished absolutely nothing. We need a yes, a confirmation, a keep on keeping on from our God. I'm going to share with you a story that is like 700 years old. A story from Julian of Norwich, the great 14th century mystic. Though I'm going to take some creative license, if you don't mind. She tells a story about a servant who came into the presence of God. Was called to come into the presence of God. And why she stood before God, God told her what God wanted her to do. I have this task for you. Here is what I want you to do. Now go. She was so excited to hear this calling upon her life. And she quickly turned around and left the throne room so enthusiastic about what had been set before her. She ran down the hallway, turned the corner, slipped and fell injuring herself really badly. She lay there embarrassed because she couldn't get up. Others came to her side. They tended to her injuries. They picked her up and they carried her back into the throne room before God. She was expecting a lecture from God about her failure. She was ashamed. But that's when God said to everyone else, this is one of my most faithful servants. You should have seen how quickly 
she left here. How enthusiastic and excited she was to serve me. She was diligent in her willingness to go, and she was injured in the process. She was stunned, and she kind of gestured toward God to come. And then she whispered, but I failed. I never got to the place you wanted me to go. I never did the work that you wanted me to do, to which God said, faithfulness. Faithfulness is success in my mind. Faithfulness. Our mission of putting love first in all things, are made for a miracle book study. This sermon series, Jerusalem at Our Backs, it's all about getting up and going and doing. It's about living faithfully into the vision of God's kingdom, the divine reign, the holy kingdom that erases every line, every boundary, every division. But here's the thing, it's, it's exhausting and hard and challenging and demanding and scary and unpredictable and exhausting and hard and challenging and all of that over again. And we need a miracle number, a 40-day period, a segment of time, an experience where God says your faithfulness is success in my mind. Keep on keeping on, and I will be with you to the ends of the age. We need that divine pep talk that does not allow for defeat to defeat us. It does not allow for a momentary feeling of uncertainty to claim us with utter hopelessness. It does not allow the negativity of others to become the voice that we follow. It does not allow for the dark night of the soul to be the tomb of our existence. For we are a people who claim that with each day there is a new dawn, a new opportunity for rebirth and renewal, and that the stone has been a rolled away from the tomb. Nathan Wilson is a colleague of mine. He now works at Christian Theological Seminary, where I did my graduate work. He wrote a piece not long ago that was printed in the Indianapolis newspaper. It is about his grandmother's cherry preserves. This is how it starts. Nana was the best cherry preserve maker ever. There was only one thing wrong with a jar of her preserves. It had a bottom. I'm told you could hoard the preserves and hide them from others and insist you were unaware of their existence and blame it on your younger brother. That's what I'm told. But no matter what your methods or mechanisms, the cherry preserves in the jar would eventually, sadly, end. Of course, my cousins, who lived in the same town as my grandmother, didn't have such a problem. They could go to Nana's house any and every day and eat preserves. They could waltz in, toast some bread, sit at the kitchen table, have a meaningful talk with Nana, and comfortably eat preserves. They didn't have to watch over their shoulder for a father or brother who at any moment would swoop in and snatch that last bit of preserves right off your plate and then bask in the glory of their crafty and cunning ways. If you thought I was envious of my cousins, you'd be right. I was envious, Nathan wrote. I love how Nathan describes the feeling of scarcity, his fear of running out, of being left with an empty jar. And the problem appeared to be the distance that he felt between him, Nathan, and the source of the cherry preserves. I believe it's the feeling that many of us have in our faith journey. When we are trying our best, 
but the best does not appear to be doing anything. When success seems unattainable, when we are trying to live the love first life and love is not given in return, when we are trying to participate in the miracles of grace that God is doing, but we are mocked and left feeling demoralized. When we are trying to expand our zone of courage and go places beyond our comfort zone to live out the boundary-breaking life, line-erasing, division-nullifying work of Jesus, and yet the pushback is intense, and we are left feeling defeated and demoralized. Suddenly, we are thinking that stash of holy preserves is beyond our reach. But it's not, folks. This is where we need to be intentional. We need to find others who will sit with us and pray with us. We need to surround ourselves with positive and encouraging voices. We need to read our Bibles, looking at the stories of resurrection and renewal. We need to find a spiritual companion. We need to see a counselor. My friends, we need to make worship a priority. There is a reason that Sunday is the first day of a new week. It is to be, as Richard Rohr suggests, a place where we get a yes from God amidst all the no's. And we desperately need that yes, that affirmation from our God as so many voices, so many other things are trying to drag us down to make us feel helpless and hopeless in the face of all the world is dealing with. We need that yes so that we can keep on keeping on so we can stretch ourselves well beyond our Jerusalems into Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth to be about the work that God is putting before us to bring the gospel, the good news of God's love to hurting and broken people. We need to be the line crossers, those who are willing to march our little feet over that line no matter how risky it is. Because this message isn't just for us. It is a message given to us but it's also a message intended to be shared through us to so many others. And we need a yes, a regular affirmation, a divine pep talk, because there's a lot going on, a lot that's suggesting that it's not worth it. You're not up to it. You're not good enough you might as well give up. And yet that's not the voice of our God, and it is not the gift of the Holy Spirit that we will be celebrating in just a few weeks that comes among us and enters into us for the good work, the good work to which we have been called. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious, and compassionate God. Following Jesus can appear so easy until we actually take that first step. And then we begin to see the challenges, feel the pushback, hear the negativity, sense the hopelessness, and it doesn't take too long before we want to return to the comfort of our Jerusalems. Provide for us, as you always have, times and places where we can hear your words of encouragement, your pep talk, that can reignite our passion for Jesus and his love first life. Take us to the mountain, to that place where we can once again perceive your gracious vision, where all the lines and divisions and boundaries that divide us are lost to your redemptive and transformative love. Give us perspective, your heavenly perspective, that can nudge us forward even when it does not appear as if our work is going to make a difference. O oh, gracious God, give us those places where we can dwell with you to be nourished, refreshed, and prepared 
to live the love first life, to be a part of the miraculous things that you are doing, that we might expand our zone of courage as we go beyond our comfort zones to share the good news of your unconditional love revealed to us in Jesus Christ. It is that Jesus that continually invites us into times of worship just like this, where we pray together a very simple prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
four minute piece, but that was a 40 day moment. It's about Solomon's temple and about going into that experience. The interesting thing is Pentecost within ancient Israel was a time when they honored and celebrated the presence of God coming into the temple. And then for Christians, Pentecost is a time when the Holy Spirit comes into the new temple, the body of Christ, the church, not so much a building, but a people that come together through the power of the Spirit. And as we come to a time of communion, as we come forth, this temple made of human beings continues to reflect the good news of welcome and grace and goodness, making sure that no one is left behind, but that all are welcome to participate in this glorious meal that represents and reminds and reinforces within us God's unconditional love. For those of you seated in this main area, you will be coming forward for communion to share in it what, what's called intention, taking a piece of bread, dipping it in the cup, and partaking of the elements. For those of you on the back row and in the balcony, communion and offering trays will be brought to you. For those offering trays, if you wish to share a gift today, but also remember your blue cards, place them there so that we can in the week ahead pray for you. All are welcome. All are welcome. And this temple, not the brick and the mortar, but the people, embody that message. We collectively say, all are welcome. Let us prepare now for a time at the table. table is set and ready, and it's available to everyone. No one is accepted, so please take a moment and let's prepare for his gift. Please pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit, grant that in the days ahead our lips which have sung your praise may speak the truth. Our eyes which have seen your love may look with compassion on the needs of the world. Our hands which have held this loaf and cup may be active in your service. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. On that day in the upper room, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, eat of this. This is my body, which is broken for you. After the meal, Jesus gave thanks and held the cup and said, drink of this, all of you. This is my blood, which is poured out for the remission of sin. As you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, 
do so in remembrance of me.
Let us pray. Lord, we come to you this morning so thankful that your love knows no boundaries and that you never give up on us no matter how far we may stray or how lost we may have become. But help us, Lord, to more readily trust in your forgiveness and your grace. Please use these gifts to receive this morning for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, some of you may be wondering what was hanging from the communion table this morning. Our children's ministry has been talking about the National Day of Prayer. It was this past week. We've been talking about it for a few weeks, and these are some of the prayers of our children. And so we brought them in and put them on the communion table. If you want to come up later and take a peek, a closer look, you're welcome to do so. We have worked now for a number of weeks with this passage from the opening chapter of Acts. We have talked about it from a lot of different angles, but really reflecting on the notion of what does it mean both individually and collectively for us to put Jerusalem at our backs, to go beyond that place that we know well, that place of comfort, and to begin to extend ourselves, where we take the gospel, the good news, and it may not be very far geographically. For some of us, it may be a walk across the office to somebody and to seek reconciliation. It might be to offer a good word. I don't know what it might be, but for you, I have a feeling that the Spirit may be already beginning to act and encourage and nudge you in that work. Next Sunday is Ascension Sunday, and then Pentecost, and it's an exciting time in the life of the church. And so I extend an invitation to the church, to God's new temple, if you will, the body of Christ. I ask and extend an invitation if someone would like to be a part of this community, to connect their lives officially, or to give their life to Jesus Christ for the first time, we would be blessed. And we invite you, if you wish, to either come forward or to meet with one of our elders or pastors out in the lobby at the close. Let us now join our voices.
invite you now to take the hand of someone close. As you are reminded in a very physical way of the presence of those around you, be reminded of that loving presence that follows us wherever we go. Let us join in this prayer. Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in a life lived in love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model, and may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. Amen.